King's College London. And today now we are very excited to be joined by Mark from General Catalyst. Uh, Mark is a partner at, at GC, uh, which is a VC firm, and they just opened their London office. Uh, they partner with mission-driven founders from seeds to growth stage. Uh, they invested in companies like Stripe, Snap, Samsara, or the platform that we are using now, Hopin. Um, Mark's recent investments include Travel Perk, Lacework, Resilience, and Rossum. Um, and he graduated from Amherst College. He's now based in London, but he's a huge Manchester United fan. Um, so, Mark, my first question to you is, you moved here with, with, to open General Catalyst office in London. How do you like London so far? What are your first impressions of the startup ecosystem and founders here? Yeah, Christopher, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I um, guess uh, I moved to London in October, but I've been working with companies in Europe for a while before that, um, throughout the pandemic and even before that. Uh, London's been, been amazing. Uh, it's kind of been kind of what I thought. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to move um, is because it's, it's an amazing ecosystem. There's a lot of fantastic entrepreneurs. I think um, we're starting to see a couple of things which are pretty interesting in the sense that we're now in stage two or three of companies that have sold. Uh, and then there are all these alumni running around um, starting their own companies. Students now starting to think more and more about um, kind of starting their own thing, dropping out of school. I'm not encouraging anybody to drop out of school, but if you have an amazing idea, it's something to, to pursue. Um, and there seems to be more and more of that. Um, I think the startup ecosystem has also been kind of helped along by a lot of amazing firms um, that have been here for such a long time that we're very fortunate to partner with and continue to partner with too. So like, it's been fantastic to meet those folks in person um, and hang out with them and meet their portfolio companies and um, collaborate a little bit more like kind of in person. Uh, which we're all kind of missing a little bit, but we get to do fun stuff like this on Hoppin. So um, yeah, no, Christopher, it's been awesome. Um, it's been really exciting and um, I'm super excited to be here. Finally, um, it took a very long time for me to move. Yeah, we are super excited that you are here and that we can partner with you guys at General Catalyst. Um, and I'd love to learn more uh, about what you're interested in when it comes to seed or early stage startups. Uh, most of our attendees are still at university. Uh, so maybe we could start off uh, by talking about your experience as a founder at Amherst. Yeah. Um, so I was, I owned and ran a, a storage, a summer storage thing, which is probably a very American thing, I would guess, for university, Christopher. Um, but so think about it as there was a very simple website. Um, I think it, I hope it's still, I hope it's down. I hope nobody can find it. Um, it's pretty embarrassing. Um, but a very simple website where you would go on and you would say, um, kind of, I have this many things. I would like to store them for the summer and have them come back to me in the fall. Um, and it was a very operationally intensive business in the sense that kind of we had to rent trucks physically. We had to hire workers uh, to physically move stuff. Um, they were mostly students and our friends, but like, and we would pay them in pizza and beer, but like it was, um, kind of like what you used to have to do every day for like kind of the last two weeks of school and the first two weeks of school um, and did that for five different college campuses um, around Amherst College. Um, it was really cool. Um, I it is not it was not a technical business in any way, shape or form. Um, we had like a outsourced person that helped us with the website and things like that, but it was operationally intensive and it was super interesting to be able to kind of quote unquote own and run a company. Um, I had to convince my father, who's a judge, to give me a loan to invest in the company uh, in the beginning. Um, so that was a little, uh, that was difficult. Similar to pitching a venture capitalist, although I wish no one uh, has to pitch my father. Uh, he's a pretty tough critic. Um, but yeah, did that and then um, like got to, got to do it. And that's kind of how I got the bug of kind of like looking at businesses, working with businesses. I didn't know. I was going to be a venture capitalist. I just knew that kind of I wanted to work with companies in some way, shape or form. And kind of my career kind of traipsed around a whole bunch of different firms and banks and things like that until I ultimately found GC, which is um, the best mix for me and one of the best firms, I think, um, for founders, regardless of stage. So whether you're seed, pre-seed, um, all the way up to pre-IPO um, and, and all the uh, and everything in between. So I focus mostly on the later stage stuff, but 
um, like everyone at GC, every once in a while, you just get captivated by an entrepreneur and you, you have to go pound the table for it. So. Yeah, that must have been a really useful experience for you as an investor now. Um, and you must be pretty good at recognizing what early stage companies are actually good. Um, so far, what types of companies have you met since you moved in here to Europe? And how is the startup ecosystem here different from the US? Yes, I've met, so I focus mostly on enterprise software. So I spend most of my days talking to anybody who's trying to solve an interesting or difficult problem in B2B business in some way, shape or form. That normally looks like um, software models, but it can look like uh, sometimes software plus payments models. It can sometimes uh, look like marketplace models as well. But anybody, any business that is selling to another business, whether it's a very small business or a very large business, that's where I spend my time. Um, so I met people attacking all sorts of different problems. Um, obviously, did travel perk in the travel space, did Rossum in the B2B um, kind of basically communi document communication space, but basically transacting back and forth. Um, and so done... A whole bunch of different things and looked at a whole bunch of different things um what i would say is quote unquote different um i think part of this thing about um that us investors some don't understand until you kind of get here um or we didn't understand until we were all on zoom and met everybody um not that different um from the states in terms of uh kind of i would say quality of entrepreneur or quality of company I do think there are some like minor differences, right? Um, when you're a smaller company in Europe and you're selling, like you sell to people that you can get in front of and get in touch with. Um, sometimes those markets can be smaller and you kind of have to jump from market to market and kind of do those sorts of things. Um, but the good thing is the pandemic kind of leveled the playing field, right? We're doing a hop and event um, with a whole bunch of people who are in a whole bunch of different places. You can sell your software pretty much anywhere. Um, and so you can be a global company much earlier than you probably could than you definitely could have 10 years ago. Um, so I think that's, I guess it's not different as much as it's just like kind of a little bit of, I think the European companies have to figure out go to market stuff faster, um, because they have to sell to multiple markets and multiple people. Um, so that's, I guess one minor difference would, would be what I would say, but that's not like an earth shattering, uh, kind of insight. Uh, I think the last thing that's been interesting in Europe is that the company's literally anywhere. Um, so it's not just focused in traditional places where there have been tons of capital. And don't get me wrong, there are lots of companies in London and Tel Aviv, but there's amazing ecosystems sprouting up um, in all sorts of different different cities around the world. You have Helsinki, which is an interesting ecosystem, Paris, obviously, um, and Copenhagen as well. And so there, there's a, I can name 20, right? Um, it's not just London uh, or just Tel Aviv uh, or, or folks like that. So that is the one thing that might be quote unquote different that people don't realize. Okay. Super, super interesting. Um, so you moved to, you just opened the London office. A lot of VCs are moving from the US uh, to Europe. Uh, why is that? Um, why are VCs opening offices in Europe or particularly London now? when it seems like you can do networking over Zoom these days? Sure, I think you can do networking over Zoom and you can try and you can do as well as you can. But I think especially in early stage investing, there's a kind of magic that happens between meeting a founder and entrepreneur in person and watching them build their company or pitch their company or make that first key hire. Um, you just can't get over Zoom. Uh, I think that matters. Um, and so, that's like a, been a very important thing for folks that want to do early stage. I think what we what I just talked about in terms of Europe now being not now it's been this way for five ten years, but like certainly that like kind of stepping into the light in terms of huge companies being built here and the pace at which huge companies are being built here is getting faster and faster. Um, just look at the amount of funding and the amount of, of folks that are worth that are unicorns or decacorns, right? Um, but I would say. I, I think that's like kind of one piece is that like people need to be here in person. Um, and then there's plenty of opportunity. Um, and so venture capitalists, just like any business, we go to the places where we think there are best, um, the best founders and the best sort of ecosystems to build the next great company. Um, London is a very natural and 
easy place to do that. It's kind of, we can get anywhere we need to go within a couple hours on a flight uh, if we need to. Uh, and also London has an amazing kind of startup scene as well by itself. So, yeah. Yeah, I think for us founders, partnering with firms like General Catalyst gives a big advantage because let's say you're starting an enterprise firm, you can start locally in London, but then if a company partners with, with GC, they can very easily move to the US because of your expertise there and your and your kind of global understanding. So I think you add a lot of value that you're based now in Europe, but also in the US uh, for a lot of funders that, that will need to expand sooner or later to the US. Um, the founders and, and our attendees uh, in the audience have a lot of choices when it comes to partnering mm -hmm. with VCs, especially as there are more VCs than, uh, for, uh, than startups now, it seems to me. <laughs> so can you talk about the general catalyst approach uh, that I keep hearing about? What does responsible innovation mean and how do you help founders build mission-driven companies? Yeah, um, I think the, the first assertion I'll make is like kind of we are along for the ride to help founders learn and understand what responsible innovation means. But the companies that are amazing companies that have put responsible innovation first have founders that want to buy into this, right? Um, and there are plenty of examples in our portfolio. Um, a couple are kind of, if you think about kind of thinking through second derivative possible issues, a company like Gusto has done an amazing job like that, right? So like they have put their customer in the center of their business at all times um, and done an amazing job with it. And their customer is, Gusto does, um, think of it as you're starting a business and you're a tiny company, you need to pay people and do a whole bunch of different things. Um, just like kind of standard stuff that like a founder or anybody who's starting a business doesn't really want to do a couple clicks. You have everything you need. Um, and, but that company has done a whole bunch of things to give their customers all sorts of different tools to be able to kind of grow and understand and, um, kind of as they grow their business, Gusto's one, another one that's always been like this and look, this is the founding team. Um, we obviously got a, got a front row seat, but Warby Parker right? Um, buy one, get one. It's not a brand in the, as big in the United Kingdom as it is in the United States. I'm sure it will be, um, but it's eyeglasses, right? Um, it's iterating on something that a lot of people need, uh, but like kind of at the end of the day, it, it was a better, more delightful. It's an amazing experience. I encourage anybody to walk into a Warby Parker store. It's like better than an Apple store experience. Um, and literally they, when you buy a pair, they give away a pair, right? In the sense that like kind of that's responsible innovation. And then Look at a company like Airbnb. We're really, really proud to have been a part of that story. But look at like what what that company has done and figured out um, in a lot of different ways. Like Brian's very upfront about it, talks a lot about it. I mean, look at what's happening in the world today. And Airbnb seems to always do the right thing. And that's not an accident. Um, they think a lot about it. They think a lot about what their platform does, what their platform could possibly do. That they don't want it to do. Um, and they act accordingly. So I think responsible innovation really it, it kind of comes down to the fact of thinking about what are the potential unintended consequences and how do I think about those things and get the advice around that earlier rather than later. And um, do you have any advice to, to, to funders in the audience? How can we think about the responsible innovation, how to approach it? Yeah, I mean, I think it varies for different industries, right? So I think there's kind of like, there's very easy, simple ones, right? Where like, you can think about if you're, I'm making up a company on the fly now, right? But like, if you're a company that sells to defense organizations, like, how are you thinking about who you're selling to? Not, not trying to get political in any way, shape or form, but just use an example. that's kind of the far end of the spectrum. Um, but, and then there's all sorts of companies that, will create the next generation of consumer apps or mobile applications or social um, applications, social commerce, things like that. Like, how do you think about, like, what if your platform does get that big that you become the next Facebook or something like that? Like, how do you think about like what might happen um, with your platform and what you can do with it without um, like from the beginning uh, and kind of have principles around that? Like, what do you want to be? and What do you not want to be? Um, I think, Founders, we ask them all the time to dream the dream and tell us what the biggest possible outcome of their company is. 
but the other thing attached to that from responsible innovation is what's the highest purpose of the company um, and do both, right? Yeah, so it's about thinking very, very long term. Uh, even though you're still an early stage founder, you need to have this long term plan. And that's something that Guillaume from Checkout also just mentioned that he's thinking um, in 10 year chunks. Uh, so it seems like a trait that a lot of great founders have. Um, so we have a few questions um, in the chat. Guys, feel free to ask some questions in the chat um, as well. Uh, I see Guy Walker is asking, what is the most interesting growth strategy hack uh, have you seen uh, or heard about over time as an investor? It's a great question. Um, the easy answer is in software product like growth has been one of the, the greatest um what are the greatest kind of innovations in terms of like kind of enterprise software, right? The ability to download something and use it immediately. I bet you the people maybe had hop in before they attended the event today, but most of them logged in very simply and just downloaded and now we're using it. Right. Um, that's something and all sorts of products that we, we do today. Um, that's an amazing growth strategy and hack. Um, I think there's a bunch of fascinating stuff happening in the consumer world right now. Um, in terms of kind of, I'm really interested, I don't know if there are startups around this, but like, I'm very interested to see how the world of like all the influencers and micro influencers of the world, the ability to go one to many with all sorts of different people that have similar interests to you, um, or to your target market, fascinating kind of thing, um, as well. Uh, so using people, using like kind of a whole bunch of different people instead of just doing like kind of very traditional marketing, I'm going to get a commercial um, during a big football match, right? Uh, it, it, like that, that sort of thing. Like it's, there's all sorts of different hacks that are coming to bear now. Um, and then I think the last part is like the most interesting and I think the most enduring moat in terms of growth strategies is your customers. Um, so there is nothing that can really replicate your customers loving your product and talking about it. Um, there are ways to incentivize them and kind of push them to talk about it a little bit more. But um, at the end of the day, the one thing that has not changed on growth uh, strategy or hack is that a whole bunch of customers that are super happy and delighted by your product, it's probably the best thing you can possibly do. Yeah, that's what probably Airbnb customers and a lot of companies that you have uh, saying. Um, so we have questions from Nick, and I guess this question will pop up all the time if we don't answer it. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the best way to break into VC scene here in London or overall? Into working in VC or in terms of getting in front of a VC? Um, into working, I guess uh, Nick is asking about becoming a, an investor. Got it. Um, I think the best way to become a venture capitalist is to spend your as much time as humanly possible with the best companies and founders um, and, or, and reading and thinking about like kind of companies and spaces. Um, that's honestly the best way you can do it. Um, we all, I think the, one of the best parts about general catalyst is that like everybody comes from a, a different background. Um, right. So I have, I have colleagues who are reporters or, or were reporters in a past life. I was a, I was a banker and then an investor. Right. So like, I'm not that interesting. Um, but I have, partners like my 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 partner on enterprise quentin who is a cto of enormous companies um right and deep and a deeply technical person my partner max worked at google um in kind of like their finance organization like he wasn't quote unquote coding but he was at google right um i think there's all sorts of different ways to get into this industry um i think it's it's the best way you can do it is one of the best indicators of whether or not you're going to be good at it is can you network and get yourself in front of as many people as humanly possible? And then over time, uh, good things will start to happen to you. So it's a relationship game, not necessarily a specific background. As you mentioned, I don't investors think have true. very different. Yeah, sorry. I, I don't think it's a specific sorry. background. And I don't think it's like kind of a relationship game as much as it's kind of yeah. relationships plus interest and curiosity and then your ability to go get in front of as many people as possible if you do those three things it'll be fine 
Perfect. Um, so another question that, that I would have is, you worked with lots of amazing founders at General Catalyst. Are there any similarities that you see between founders that you worked with, between the great ones? Are there any common traits that they have? Um, I think um, Guillaume's point on thinking in 10 year chunks, the best founders will think that way from the beginning. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's that piece for sure. Um, and then I think the other attribute that I always look for in founders is their ability to switch very quickly from the 10 year view or the broad, the broadest view they can possibly have, and then flip all the way down to tell me exactly how much it costs them to acquire a customer through a certain channel, like the depth and breadth of a founder, um, and look, I'm not encouraging founders, and nor I think would would you find that the best founders that are running big scaled businesses know that exact answer to that question that I just said out loud. But like kind of in the early to growth stages, that's a good kind of barometer for me. Do they have and can they sell me on the vision for what they have um, of the world going forward? And then do they have like a, a very good grasp of, of kind of what their company actually does and whether the, what are the inputs and how much it costs or what they need to grow and things like that. Um, that's like kind of one thing that like, I always see like our best founders. What And then I think the last part is, I think the second one that I always look for is like, they have a steadfast view of the world, like their view of the world and, and hunger and drive to go do it when no one else wants to do it. Um, I find the best founders and the founders I continue to stay in touch with, even if I pass on making an investment with them, they push me very, very hard um on why um and they're always curious and they're always trying to understand and kind of get more input from people they think are intelligent um and things like that like i had a, a founder last week that um i passed with and it took um two 30 minute phone calls for me to pass on him because i was i was i was compelled but he wanted more information as to why um and perfectly reasonable to i probably gave him a, a lot more time because i was a little i would say uh, I was, I was in, in two minds on it, but I would say, what I would say about him is like, he is driven and like, I will talk to him again in six months and he'll probably tell me why I was, uh, why I was wrong. Cool. Um, so it's about being very, very driven on one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, having this very detail oriented understanding, but also a long-term vision of where the company is going to be in 10 years. Yeah. Um, so a bit different question from Alex. Um, many people believe we are heading into a shaky private market this year. Uh, what do you think are the implications for investors at early and later stage? Really good question. Um, if I knew uh, the if I knew the exact answer to this, I think I'd be um, pretty. It'd be, it'd be pretty amazing. Um, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think the implications for everybody are that. Um, you're going to have to be in the best possible companies. Um, I think seeing around corners is like very important now versus kind of what we saw over the past 18 and 24 months where everything was going really, really fast. Everything is still going fast would be what I would say for the best companies. Um, but I think now there's going to be more scrutiny. There's going to be more kind of focus on fundamentals versus just that kind of, top line momentum. Um, I think there's going to be um, less of these unbelievably fast follow on routes, right? So raise the, raise the B and four months later, raise the C um, at a ginormous number. Um, I think there'll be less of that, um, which is what's going to happen, but, but there's still, there's still so much capital available to entrepreneurs um, in our markets. Um, and it forces people like us to be the best versions of ourselves. So um, it's a very, it's a very robust market. There's plenty of plenty of money out there for folks that are building amazing things. Um, but in terms of like being able to get um, unbelievable valuation marks really, really quickly um, right on top of each other, I do think that's going to slow down for sure. Okay, perfect. And um, Alex uh, has a follow on question. Sure. Um, I saw you led um, the investment in Heyday. What are some of the most exciting consumer trends you are looking at right now? So 
I would say a couple in, we should talk to my partner, Nico, about the exciting consumer trends because he knows all the, all the cool stuff. Um, but I would say a couple exciting consumer trends are um, overall, like consumers move to away from like their affinity for like big, huge established brands for things that like kind of their friends and, and kind of people like. Um, so for instance, like kind of, I'm sure we've all now probably either bought something directly through Instagram or at least been influenced to buy it, right? By something that like our friends have or something that's getting posted or things like that. That's a new, new, fairly new-ish trend, a uh, consumer. Um, I think the metaverse crypto world is fascinating. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting companies that already are. Um, I don't know enough about it yet. I continue to kind of read on the side and ask all my smart friends um, about kind of what's going on because um, I don't spend all my days there. Um, but I think consumer is going to be a fascinating place to be in the next kind of like two or three years. I also think that the final thing in like consumer trends, just like a very broad macro statement is the pace has always been quickly quick and consumer like adoption curves are fast. Technology, technological innovation is very quick. Um, but I would say in consumer now that gets moved even further forward. Um, it's faster. Adoption curves are faster. Um, the ability to get a whole bunch of people on an application really, really quickly is kind of happening. I mean, look at what happened with Clubhouse, um, like that like moment that they had, right? Like that's like, there's going to be more and more of those um, that are really interesting. So um, those are kind of a couple of things. I don't spend all my days in consumer. Hey, Dave was kind of, um, it's a it's a little bit of a B2B or a B2C play, depending on how you think of it. But um, yeah, those are some exciting things in consumer that I stare at. So how about we ask the same question, but about the enterprise? Uh, sure. What are the most exciting trends that, that you see there? Um, very excited about SMB software. Um, continue to be excited about that. So anything that you can think of that a business needs to run its company uh, in terms of kind of focusing on SMBs, I think that's interesting. Um, we're still, strangely, people don't, um, think enough about, we're still in the early innings of cloud data warehouses, uh, getting penetration. So everybody will know Snowflake, um, but there's a bunch of other ones. Um, we're still in the early innings of that. If you think about, um, how big those companies are relative to the overall market size and to see the massive shift of data moving into those. So like there will be an enormous amount of amazing companies that come out of that. There already are, um, but there'll be more and more. Um, that's a trend in enterprise. Um, and then the last two are, would I be, I would talk a little bit about it are kind of, they come out of lack of labor. And so the labor needs to be a little bit more, um, productive. So there's still a lack of developers worldwide. Um, so making developers as productive as fast as humanly possible and keeping them happy with the tools that they like, um, there are still just massive gains to be had there. Um, we're investors in a bunch of them um, and we continue to look at a ton of them. They're amazing companies and they can grow very, very quickly because if you have a product that developers love and it's an important part of the development life cycle, it can happen. So that's one. The other one is in security specifically. There aren't a lot of people that are quote unquote trained to be security analysts. So it's forced us, um, excuse me, not us, the founders that we invest in to be able to innovate around that um, and be able to give those people who may not, there may not be a lot of them, but give them amazing tools to be able to be force multipliers for their jobs um, and drown out the noise of all the kind of crazy stuff that we see in the world happening right now. So those are kind of a oh, big, big kind of swath of macro trends. And then there's obviously like little itty bitty, deep, not itty bitty, but like kind of short sprints that we all go on every once in a while. So yeah that's super exciting um and kira is asking um curious to hear your thoughts on how you think gc differentiates or will be competitive uh, against other us vcs with european teams especially with a lot of them uh coming in recently yeah i think look at the end of the day competition's a good thing like i said um like it forces us to be the best version of ourselves um i do think we are a firm that 
it is, I think every founder who's worked with GC, I think they're kind of surprised. Um, the radical collaboration we have, uh, it's one of our core values, but like, I would say like founders don't really understand it until they kind of feel it, which is basically my partner, Trevor asked me on a Friday night, uh, to help him or one of his portfolio companies probably drop what I'm doing, uh, to go help and, and, and do that. Um, whatever that might be, uh, whether that's getting an introduction to a potential customer or a potential hire or help them think through a follow on round or an M and a target or something like that's kind of what we do. And similarly, if I called him on, uh, this morning or right after this phone call and said, Hey, I really need help doing this thing. I want our managing partner, but Hamant would do that for me. Um, so I do think that's, that is a differentiator for us and it's, um, it's not a, cold and fast fact it's more an experience but i do think it's a referenceable experience um that folks can folks can go call around and, and ask about um and i encourage all founders to do that and ask ask about us um because we um it's gotten competitive and it's forced us to be the best version of ourselves so cool um anna has the next question um vcs have different different approaches when it comes to the involvement in business processes and valuation after the investment has been made. What is the approach of GC uh, when the investment has been made? Yeah, I think uh, it's the way we work with companies. We operate um, with a couple kind of principles at the highest level. So the first is do no harm, right? So we never want to walk in and say, we do things this way and therefore that's how you're going to do things. That's not how we work. Um, I think, and it varies by stage, right? And so like kind of the bigger companies might only want our help on like one particular thing outside of joining the board and giving general advice, right? Um, but I would say how we generally work is, and the most important thing in the process of getting to know a VC is we do diligence on a company. We kind of share how we're thinking about it and what we're finding and what we're hearing with the founder and with the team. Um, of the company and kind of that's how we kind of develop the quote unquote um, value creation playbook of what we're going to do. It could be very simple things um, like, Hey, like we need to hire a VP of customer success. Okay. Like now you have so many customers, you should probably have somebody who wakes up and lives and breathes, making them successful and making them happy. Um, it could be as simple as that. It could be as complicated as, Hey, we need to make a small token acquisition to make a, like f fulfill our product suite. That could be something we could help people think through. Um, there's all sorts of different ex examples, but at the end of the day, there's not an equation that says, okay, we're gonna invest in this company and then we're gonna do these 16 things. Um, the only thing that I do say we will do with every single company, which I do think is extremely valuable um, and our talent team is amazing. Um, we do onboard them to uh, a whole bunch of kind of internal talent tools to be able to help them identify, recruit, um, and kind of continue to hire the best possible talent into their companies. Um, we're particularly good and, and, and best um, at helping kind of that VP and up level um, all the way to independent board members. Um, that's where we're most kind of useful and where we think we can add the most value and also it gives the company the most leverage. That's the thing that regardless of size and stage, like that we spend a lot of time with companies on this hiring because it's the most important thing you can do. Cool. So there isn't one one formula that, that you follow for every company. It's very personalized support. Um, we have a question from uh, Joaquin. Uh, what is more important, the team or the product? Wow. Amazing question. Um, If I had to pick one, it's probably the team. Um, plenty of people can build amazing products. If you have a bad team, you're not gonna be able to get it in people's hands and build and scale a company. Um, there have been examples where people have just built amazing products and like kind of it just, it just continues, it just works almost in spite of the team. Um, but I would, I would be very surprised if, you had a whole bunch of really successful companies that didn't have successful teams. Um, at the end of the day, technology companies build amazing products, but then from there, 
um, it's all about teams and scaling and kind of having the best possible people in every single place. Um, I, I do think great teams figure stuff out um, and will kind of will prevail in the long run for sure. And you've seen a lot of great teams over your work at GC. Um, what advice would you give to people hiring um, that you saw with founders at GC? How do you build a great team? Yeah, I think the first thing is get, go talk with as many people in the role you're hiring who are, excuse me, um, two or three levels higher up or like kind of, so say you're a series B company, I would go interview and you're looking for a CFO. I would go interview a public company ready CFO and spend time with them and ask them what they do um, and how they look and how they like hire their team and things like that. I do think a lot of founders make the mistake of hiring the person that they need right in that moment and not the person for kind of two rounds from now or three rounds from now that can not only hire below themselves and get what you need done immediately, but then also help you drive the business towards and scale towards the end goal, not just do the thing, which is currently kind of driving you crazy as a founder or something that you need in order to kind of leverage your time, but help find a strategic partner. So I think one of the things is like people don't spend enough time thinking about and understanding what great looks like and then optimizing downwards. Um, not in the sense of like their worst quality folks, but maybe it's just somebody you say, hey, like I really want somebody who's built a finance team. Um, and that's something I'm not going to compromise on, but I might be willing to compromise that they don't know like a certain ERP system or something like that. Like there's there's puts and takes to anything um, or like a VP of product or a, a CMO. Um, there might be things that you want um, that you might not get. And then there might be things that you say you need, but you won't be able to understand those if you don't go talk to people who are great. Um, so whenever I have a company that wants to go hire a C-level type of person, I always ask them, well, who have you spoken with that is amazing at this job at a different company that you really kind of admire? Um, and if they haven't done that work yet, then I strongly encourage and, and try to persuade them to go do that work, if that makes sense, Christopher. Yeah, makes complete sense. Um, we have a very kind of early stage question um, about co-founders from Luke. What do you think yeah. is the most important trait to look out when looking for other co-founders? Would you prioritize skills and expertise or passion and curiosity? I think in the early stages, passion and curiosity combined with how you and that person mesh um, and how you think about the world. I think in the earliest stages of investing, if you look at all the companies we've done, other people have done, like they don't end up as these amazing companies exactly how these founders envision them, right? And so it's more about passion, curiosity. Are you guys aligned um, on kind of how you see the world and how you want to work and how you want to build a company? Um, because there's tons of famous examples. I mean, Slack was never supposed to be what it was, right? Um, but that ultimately got created and then became this amazing ubiquitous tool that everybody uses. Um, but that's not what it set out to be in the beginning. And that's an example. And there's plenty of other examples like that. So um, that's, that's what I would say. I think passion, uh, passion and curiosity, and then uh, kind of how you two fit together. And Airbnb is another great example of yeah. uh, great founders, yeah. but very different and very bad idea in the beginning. Um, we have a great question from Artem, um, and I think that's going to be last or we'll have um, time for one more. Okay. How do you think that data-driven startups are going to be affected by increasing regulation and the emerging trend of uh, decentralized networks? Amazing question. Um, we should spend more time on it than we have. Um, I think increasing regulation is a good and fair thing that should be happening for kind of these data-driven startups. Um, it's something that people have to contend with and understand a little bit more, um, especially in Europe um, where the regulations are more aggressive, frankly, um, than in the States. Um, so what I, what I think it does um, is it forces them, you can't just kind of buy your way through it 
in the sense of like kind of buying all sorts of like kind of landing pages or things like that, how you used to, you have to kind of um, spend more time, like really building like true moats around like kind of customer demand and audience. Um, so that's one. And then what I would say is um, I fully understand the second part of the question in terms of the emerging trend of decentralized networks, but I am not smart enough on that part of the market yet to really give you a great answer on that. Um, I think it matters is at the end of the day, what it means. Um, but I don't know. Um, I haven't thought of the second, third and fourth, uh, derivative kind of issues that come with that, um, or opportunities to be honest. Um, I, I generally when stuff like this happens, the smartest and most interesting people and most driven people in the world find the opportunity in it. Um, I think we're in the early innings there, but that's a great, that's a great question. There's a company in that question. Cool. Thanks, uh, Artem, for the question. Um, and a question from my co-founder, Daniel. What direction uh, do you see the VC industry going with the rise of micro VCs alongside life cycle mega funds, as well as segment specific funds? Who will win? Who will lose? I don't know whether I would say, like, I would classify the winning and losing by the, the type of investor they are, right? The micro VCs or the mega funds or sector specific funds. Um, I think the ones that will win will, will win in the same way that everybody else has always won. They'll have different products, but if you are serving the best possible founders on planet earth in the best way that you can and helping them scale their companies and you do it in a honest and forthright way uh, and and work really hard and try to do the best you possibly can. Like those are going to be the winners, right? Now you might win more in a certain sector where it matters more that you know that you only spend time in fintech or healthcare or things like that. Look, like we're a large fund and we literally, like we organize ourselves around certain verticals, right? I only spend time in enterprise versus my partners who are amazing at healthcare versus my partners who are amazing at consumer versus my partners who are amazing at fintech. Like we've made that assertion because we think you need to be um, up on all those trends. So I do think there's a there's a level of specificity, but at the end of the day, you can be as smart as you want to be in any vertical, but if you're not doing uh, your best for the founder, you're not going to build an enduring firm or strategy in any way, shape or form. Perfect. So that was um, our last question. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining and uh, sharing lots of knowledge with us, with, with young founders. Hopefully you'll invest in some of the funders in our audience. Uh, and thank you for partnering with us with Seedry. Um, of course. So, yeah. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks. And...